Welcome to the sixth hour of the BEST program. In this hour, we're going to talk about site planning and coordination. As always, we're going to have learning objectives in this hour. First and foremost, we want to talk about what makes a successful SIP install. It takes a lot of coordination, and we want to discuss the things that we need to think about before the job even starts and what those site conditions might be. As always, we're going to talk about safety hazards because the last thing we want to do is put SIPs up and get somebody hurt. We'll talk a little bit about delivery and what the industry deals with in terms of delivering SIP packages and how to coordinate those deliveries. We want to talk about equipment needs. When setting SIPs, depending upon the site, we have specific equipment requirements, whether they be forklifts or cranes. We're going to talk a little bit about those um, issues. We're also going to have discussion, discussions about the um, coordination of the other subtrades. As we get ready to start a project, again, before we even show up. These discussions need to occur so that we know that when it's time to start putting the SIPs up, we're doing it efficiently. We don't want to have any slowing down or any issues in that regard. And of course, the first thing that we look at when we get on site is going to be the foundation. So we'll touch on things like foundation, as well as getting the crew set up and defining what makes a good crew, as well as getting the panels offloaded, staged, and ready for that first day of installing panels. So first and foremost, let's get started with talking about what is the perfect site? Or is it a perfect site? When we go to install SIPs on any site, um, we need to ask ourselves, first off, are you the builder or are you just the installer? There's many people that are going to be going through this course that might not be the turnkey general contractor, but might only be approaching this as the installer. And if you're the installer, the worst mistake you can ever make is to quote a job and not go to the site take a look at it before you give that number. Whereas if you're the builder, you already know what the site looks, you know what those problems or interferences might be that you're going to encounter during that SIP install. Case in point, I've seen jobs quoted for a standard installation and when the installer showed up two states away, found out that the house is on the side of the cliff or that all the panels had to be carted up a narrow alley in order to get to, a, um, to the actual build. Restrictions because they're in an urban city areas create big problems in terms of installing that particular package. So you really have to understand what does this site look like and how are we going to get through it with the least amount of problems so that we know that the uh, installation moves efficiently and effectively. One of the things we want to look at when we start talking about sites, overhead obstructions. This is a safety issue and, and all safety issues need to be looked at. Overhead instructions tends to be a big one, especially when we start looking at equipment, equipment concerns such as cranes and forklift. The last thing we need is an overhead line or trees or something getting in the way that's going to create a safety issue with cranes. It's a big part of the uh, safety training that we promote in this BEST program. Um, the interference of trees and limbs can lead to slowing down your install. And can you prune those things? Can you get them out of your way? These are the types of coordination issues that you have to make uh, be aware of. One of the things that I also talk about is weather, scheduling and planning a project according to weather issues. I know builders that look at quoting projects and literally will quote projects based on the time of the year. Uh, for instance, are we in a rainy season? I've seen a project quoted in the mountains of Utah where the quote was one number to install it during the month of August. And if it was any other month, the price doubled because you're dealing with weather issues. Let's not make the mistake of dealing with panels, especially when we're dealing with a panel that has a wood skin, perhaps, and those wood skin issues and moisture issues may combine to affect the ability for that panel to perform the way we want it to perform. So weather can be a very big thing. We need to schedule around that. We need to understand that we can install panels maybe in the rain, but if they get wet, we have to let them dry out. And that's all part of what we talked about in building science, and that is we have to plan for bulk weather. We have to plan for water getting into our system, but then also giving it a way to get out and dry out. And it's this installation of this SIP package that we want to make sure we haven't sealed up and trapped moisture inside. So by working through those weather issues at the get-go, it might save us a lot of problems in terms of durability of a panel in the, in the, on the back end. And then, of course, the last thing that I would mention in terms of weather is wind. Um, we've installed products on the beach, on top of mountains where we're in very windy conditions. A SIP is a sail. A big 8 by 24 foot panel hanging from a crane can be something that can be very dangerous if you're working in windy conditions. In some cases, 
even the size or the design of that structure because of the conditions of the site may affect how you design that project. Perhaps building with an 8x24 formatted panel is not a good idea for that particular site condition and you need to look at something smaller. Um, this also comes into play in terms of access of the site. How big a panel can I get onto this site? It's a big issue that you need to think about before or during the, the coordination. One of the things that we want to be very clear about is what your particular role is in this project. Again, we talked about the difference between the builder and the installer. You have very clear focus on getting the job finished, but you have different paths to get there. If you're the builder, you're thinking big picture. You're thinking the coordination of a lot of different trades. If you're the installer, you are the trade that you are most concerned with, and that's you. So as the installer, you may not be thinking about the foundation guy and the guy that's doing the stonework or the roofing behind you. Whereas if you're the builder, you need to be able to look at that big picture and coordinate all of those various trades. It is this coordination of trades that not only makes just the install go smoother, but also makes the entire build go smoother. If you're the installer, however, you do want to make sure that your coordination specifically with the builder or the homeowner or whomever gives you a clean, clear site where you're not being affected by other trades while you're putting the panels up. We want the focus when this install happens to be all about you and all about the panels. You've got big material moving around, taking up a huge amount of the workspace, and you can't be um, interfered with by other trades running around getting in your way. You really need to insist on that you have the open opportunity to move through this, um, this whole project. Let's concentrate a little bit on safety. Safety is important, and at the beginning of this introduction of the BEST program, uh, it was discussed that it's an integral part of the training of the builder certification. And that's important because we want to keep everybody safe at the end of the day. Everybody wants to go home with the same number of fingers and toes that they showed up with. We, through this program, are promoting and, and requiring the completion of a certain number of OSHA uh, training doctrines. The one being the fall arrest program. Let's face it, we put a lot of SIPs on the top of structures and when we're putting roof panels on people fall off roofs so the fall arrest program is important to take into consideration that it has to be done and everybody on the crew should go through fall arrest training in addition forklift OSHA fork truck or all-terrain forklift operations is required not only is it a good idea because it's the right thing to do but when you start thinking about accidents that occur with fork trucks which is a very common piece of equipment used in the SIP industry the vast majority of the people that are getting hurt with forklifts isn't the guy sitting on the forklift, it's the other people that are getting hurt. So we need to get these people trained because forklifts are a very, very good, useful piece of equipment when it comes to working with SIPs and on construction sites in general. So this training is absolutely crucial. The other thing that we like to recommend, or that I'm certainly recommending, is that you look at the OSHA 10-hour course. Taking the OSHA 10-hour course is, is really a good investment in your business and, and, your, and your life safety. Uh, don't be afraid to look at techniques like contacting your workers' comp provider to see if they'll offer you this training at no charge. If they don't, the options are online for taking online OSHA training is infinite. There's a number of them out there that you can take advantage of. And I strongly recommend that you do that because, like I said, at the end of the day, we all want to go home. The entire crew wants to go home in one piece. Let's talk about the crew then. The crew, for most SIP installs, in your own experience, you will probably have found that you're using somewhere in the neighborhood of three to five people. I think three to five men working on a crew is a good number. Sometimes you only want three. Sometimes when the crane shows up, you want five because we need to bulk that crew up. It's true that one person on this crew, maybe that's yourself, is the lead on this crew. You're the one that has the knowledge, has all the knowledge about how SIPs work, how they go together, the proper sealing details and techniques, and the rest of the people on the crew may just be there as a strong back, and that's okay. However, some manufacturers and some people in the SIP industry have suggested that SIPs are a do-it-yourself tool or a do-it-yourself product, and therefore anybody can put SIPs together. I strongly disagree with that. You're going to find over all of the talks that I'm giving, the technique of installing SIPs requires good understanding of construction skills. It understands things like plumb level and square, and if you don't know how to properly seal panels and deal with problems, you have a problem. So the crew assuredly should have at least one person that is infinitely well trained in SIPs and hopefully this person might be you in fact. 
The reason I say that the crew size might jump up to as many as five or even six people could be on crane day. There's nothing worse than seeing a crane operator asleep in his cab. So we want to keep that crane running because, again, that's all part of efficiency. Let's get these people moving and get those, crane, those panels going as quickly as we possible can. A good crew, everybody has an assignment. Everybody knows what they're doing. There's people that are working on the ground, doing the staging and the prep and the rigging. There's people up on the roof or up on the deck that are actually setting the panels and doing the, uh, the work of sealing and fastening. It's the coordination of these assignments that makes sure that these panels go up quickly and efficiently. And that's really what we're all about. Now, if we go back to a second and we start thinking about the site, again, because it's important that we're laying the groundwork for a successful install, that is to talk about access to unload and stage. Panels can be very big, and when panels are very big, they take up a lot of room. So I want you to think very strongly about the amount of room that you have to spread out panels, how you're going to prep those panels, and then get them installed onto the project quickly. This is what we call job site management. It's one of the big elements that I like to emphasize in training issues is that if you get your job site management wrong, it's going to bite you. Big trucks and big panels take up space. You got to get big trucks into the job site and big panels take up a lot of the site on space. Plan for it. And you have to have space for the equipment then to pull in after you've unloaded the panels or even to unload the panels themselves. Make sure that your truck can get close enough to that foundation that your panels can be offloaded and set close to that foundation so you have good access to them to get them moved around. Again, this also you have to look at the size of the panels and how much room you need to spread out in order to pre-assemble and put panels together. Room to pre-assemble and prep is absolutely critical and it's not something that you should take lightly. If you have limited size on a particular job site, you have to deal with the thought of, did I order the right type of panel package? Because the right type of panel package might mean that you don't have huge jumbo panels, but you have smaller panel packages. You can't lift up an 8 by 24 foot panel and carry it through that garden gate. You're going to need to design from the get-go into a smaller format panel. So it's the access to the site and it's the size of the site that are critical towards the efficiency of how quickly those panels are going to go up. The SIP industry delivers the vast majority of their panels on common carriers. It's important to understand this because when a manufacturer loads their panels or your panel package onto a common carrier and it heads off down the highway to come find you, there's a certain amount of loss of control. There can be a loss of communication as well and this is important because you as the builder don't want to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning with a crew and equipment and the clock ticking by and no panels on site. I encourage you to work very closely with your manufacturer or your uh, panel provider and understand who's bringing the panels, how you best communicate with them, and when a realistic time for them to show up is. After all, you're talking about an independent carrier, and sometimes independent carriers might be sh uh, short on hours, and they physically just can't get there within the limits of the law. So it's these kinds of things that if you haven't planned for, Next thing you know, your panels are going to show up three hours late and you're going to be hopping mad that you've got a crane sitting there that's costing you $180 an hour. These are the kind of things that we don't want to have happen. So it's this type of communication, the communication with the dispatcher, the communication with the manufacturer to make sure that you know when to expect this panels to get there so that you're ready for them with all the equipment needed so that you can get it unloaded quickly. And remember, the typical common carrier is going to give you about two hours to get panels unloaded. So to be properly prepared to get them to unload is important because after that they're going to start uh, potentially racking you up with additional charges and you don't want those demurrage charges after two hours. So remember, proactive communication. Make sure that you have those cell numbers. Make sure that you have good directions of that truck driver. I can't tell you the number of times I've heard of truck drivers missing the road and then they show up three hours later after having been lost for three hours and no way to get a hold of the builder. Don't make that happen on your job site. In looking at the site again, the foundation is sticking it out of the ground, assuming that we're not slab on grade, and we have to make sure that, that foundation was done right. One of the big questions I often ask, answer is the question of tolerances. What kind of foundation should we best install this SIP package over? My answer is, I don't really care. We can put SIPs over any type of a foundation. That foundation might be an ICF, it might be a poured uh, concrete uh, foundation, block, tilt up concrete, any number of things are fine. It's really the tolerance issues that we want to keep track of. If your SIP package has been, as we talked about, ordered as a 
a ready to install or ready to assemble format. It's the accuracy with which that package is cut that we can't change the design to fit an out of square, out of plumb, and out of level foundation. So it's, a, it's important that you take the time to work with the foundation as it goes in to ensure those accuracies comply or marry up to the accuracies that's inherent in a SIP system that's been cut on a CNC machine. This is critical because if it's out of square, out of plumb and out of level, you have to make those adjustments to fix it. So let's make sure that the foundation goes up right the first time. We also want to look at bearing points. You've got a, a, a SIP drawing and the structural engineering that's gone along with that package which defines those point loads. You should have already communicated those point loads to your foundation to make sure that you've addressed where they're happening in that foundation and, and you can do and accurately line those things up. Otherwise you're going to have to go back in and make changes after the panels have shown up and after you're putting the panels in place. Be mindful of where those point loads are coming down. The foundation should have straight walls because your panels are going to be straight. So make sure that you're looking at the dimension of the foundation, the squareness of the foundation, and whether or not it's too big or too small. I tell people that when we check the deck and we start to put the first panels up, it's always better to have a deck a little too big than a little too small. It's easier to let a panel package grow than it is to cut and force it to shrink. By using a variety of different sealing techniques, it's quite simple to make a panel package wall grow or fit a deck or a foundation that's a little bit big. So when it comes to foundations and decks, my rule of thumb is that your tolerance should be negative zero and plus a little bit. What's a little bit? That depends on the size of your building. It could be plus an eighth, could be plus an inch. If you're talking about a big project, even an inch can be buried within the expansion of the joints within a panel system. Use it to your advantage. Don't get yourself backed into a corner by tightening things up too tight. And whatever you do, don't make them smaller. In your review of the uh, foundation, and especially in the site uh, slab on grade uh, conditions that you're working on top of sometimes, is that you look at things like plumbing and electrical feeds. It's these trades and the coordination of these trades that have to be addressed before the panel package shows up. If you have an electrical box at one end of your project and a slab on grade with plugs required at the other end of your project, somehow the wiring needs to get through that house. What's the best way for it to happen? Well, it can go through the SIP system. It can go through interior partitions. It may be able to go overhead into the roof uh, space or the conditioned attic space. But if none of those options work very well, you should have planned for something going under the slab. This means we have to think about how do our electrical uh, and plumbing trades get from point A to B. The time to think about that is before you've put that slab into the ground, not after the panels have shown up and then the electrician arrives to site to say, hey, I don't know how to get this wire over to this other end of the building. These are the types of things you need to do. That's why meeting with your electrician, the coordination and meeting with them to discuss getting power from point A to B is important and should always be done before this job ever, ever starts. In addition, that review should be done by perhaps the architect, maybe the homeowner, certainly by yourself, um, and the other sub-trades. Again, I'm talking about the umbrella of coordination of this entire trade so that it's the things that we haven't planned for wind up getting us in trouble and costing us more money and losing efficiency. I'd like to talk a little bit now about the concept of panels are so easy anybody can do it. The idea that it's a do-it-yourself system. If we think about panels as a big, rigid frame, and we haven't started building that foundation and working our way up, staying plumb level and square, it's very difficult in some cases to modify or to fit. This is what I call cheating the system. If we're building with stick framing and our structure is a couple inches out of square, it's absolutely not very difficult to take trusses and cheat them over until we can get our roof back on that out of square condition, everything lines up, nobody's the wiser except maybe you and the cornice crew guy. If you're dealing with large panels and you try to take an 8 by 24 foot panel and move just one corner of it, you have to move at least two other corners. You can't rack it out of, you can't move that panel out of rack. It has to stay in that perfect rectangular or square shape. Think about this. The adjustments are more difficult to make. This is why I say building with SIPs actually forces you to be a better builder. Not only do you need to start plumb level and square, but you have to build up plumb level and square because you can't cheat the system. 
So I absolutely believe that building with these SIPs is going to make you a better build, make you a better builder. Let's talk about equipment options, and not only the options of equipment that you have that you can use for setting SIPs, but also the specs of that equipment. It's important that if you've never used some piece of equipment, that you understand what's the correct piece of equipment to use. I find that there's really three ways to set panels. We can set them by hand, we can set them with a forklift, or we can set them with a crane. And I'll say crane referring to either a boom truck or a real crane. And there's a little bit differences between the two. If we're going to set them by hand, hopefully we have a good reason to do that. Either we got a whole bunch of people and we want to keep them all busy setting panels by hand, or it's the type of project where we couldn't get equipment on site. And that's okay too. Let's hope we've designed for it and we understand that we need smaller panels because we have to set them by hand. I've unloaded 8 by 24 foot panels off of trucks by hand, not that I want to do it again. I've set two-story building panels by hand, not that I want to do it again. I'd rather use the equipment that allows me to do it safely and more efficiently. First piece of equipment that I think is probably the most useful and maybe the most often used piece of equipment is the all-terrain fork truck or also forklift. Extending boom forklift is sometimes referred to. This multifaceted piece of equipment does some wonderful things for us. First and foremost, they're readily available. They're not terribly expensive. The, um, they are useful in the fact that they can unload SIPs. In fact, I believe that you can offload a truckload of SIPs with a forklift much, much faster than you can with a crane and certainly a whole lot easier than by hand. The forklift will also move material around for you, help you stage material. It'll move a lot of things just other than SIPs. And it can also become very useful in actually putting SIPs in, whether it be wall or roof panels. Now, at the point where we're ordering this forklift, we need to make sure that we're ordering the right one. As you may or may not know, that forklifts come in this amount of uh, capacity that they have to extend as well as the amount of weight that they can pick up. Typically, you'll find that forklifts that are designated as a 636 would be lift capable of lifting 6,000 pounds and extending out 36 feet. This is a good standard size that will unload trucks very, very easily and efficiently as well as also allow you to set all kinds of panels. Now, if you're setting high roof panels, you may want to look at something that has a little more capacity. You may be looking at a 42, 48, or even a 56-foot boom. Again, it can be used to set your entire roof package using an extending boom fork truck. Let's make sure we've got a trained operator on that piece of equipment, though, when we're setting roof panels, because that can be a little bit tricky if you're not familiar with it. Now, this piece of equipment also is capable of handling a lot of different accessories. This makes it more useful. Accessories include uh, truss boom extensions, which is, allow us to reach out a little bit further. In some cases, they can have live load line winch lines, which give us a, a crane capacity at the end. They also can handle fork extensions. Fork extensions are a great thing because if you're unloading eight foot wide panels and all you've got is 48 inch forks on your forklift, you're going to run into a problem, although there's tricks to work, away, uh, work around that as well. But the forklift, again, has these different accessories including man basket that make it multi-useful. They can, from the start of the job to the very finish of the job, can be a nice, useful piece of equipment. And the key element here also is cost. One thing I want to warn you about when using forklifts is don't overlook the cost of forklifts when it comes to delivery and pickup, as well as the insurance and the fuel that goes along with that. These are things that I've known that have bitten me when not being ready for what those costs are. Make sure you know the whole picture. Now, if you take that cost of that forklift and you start comparing it to cranes, it's not too hard to see that that forklift for an entire week on site is probably the equivalent to the crane for about one day. When we talk about cranes, we can use uh, boom trucks, which are a, a smaller form of a crane, or a real true crane. We've gone all the way up to set panels with tower cranes, in fact. Um, it just depends on the size of the panel and how much reach you have. Don't be afraid to let the crane company come out and specify the piece of equipment. They want to know how much weight you're lifting, and they want to know how far you're having to reach out. Those are the two key elements to properly specify the crane. Let them specify the crane if you're not familiar with it, if you've never worked with them. Hopefully you have, and this is, a, is not going to be a, a long learning curve for you. But it's these cranes that have to have access to get off of, onto your site and be able to reach out to the distance that you need and set what it is that you have. We specified the correct equipment. Now let's make sure that we have the right equipment there when we need it. We have to unload these SIPs. When the SIPs show up on the common carrier, we want to quickly and effectively get them unloaded, or quickly and efficiently get them unloaded. We can use either piece of equipment. Either will work, 
Some work a little better than others, depending upon whom you ask. I find that the installers who own a crane think cranes work better, and the installers who own forklifts think forklifts work better. What you need to look at is the cost of the material, when it needs to be there so that you can effectively do the job. To unload a truck, I find using a forklift is the safest, easiest way to unload panels. If you're dealing with wide panels, which in a jumbo format would be an eight foot wide panel, you need to make sure that you've got the accessory, which is gonna be fork extensions. You need those fork extensions in order to make sure that the panels aren't tilting off the front of forks that are only 48 inches long. You can then take this uh, forklift and use it to move all your material around to help stage it. If you're unloading with a crane, you have to look at things like spreader bars. If a crane is unloading panels with a spreader bar or also pick bars, it's these strong metal bars that go underneath the panel that allow you to pick up large stacks of panels at one time and set them on the ground. If you're in fact are using a crane to offload the truck, offload all of those panels and put them on the ground, you have to consider whether or not you need that crane to stick around or you're not gonna need them again until days or weeks later when you're only using them to set panels on the roof. This is where you're juggling the different types of equipment and knowing that you got the right one there at the right time. If you decide that you don't need either piece of equipment and you want to hand unload the truck, well, I wish you the best of luck. It can be done, but it takes enough people so that nobody gets hurt. It is, it is done on rare occasion, but occasionally it's uh, not the best of ideas. When you're unloading panels, you have to be concerned with damage, damage to the panel. It happens. If you're not using pick bars and you're trying to offload with straps, it's very common to see strap damage on the bottom of the stack, and that strap damage is something that you're going to have to fix at a later point in time. The other type of strap damage that you might see is actually on top of the stack. And the reason that strap damage happened was typically because of the truck driver either ratcheted things down too tightly or the manufacturer didn't put the proper strap protection or the dunnage protection on top of the panels. And when this happens again, you need to fix it. So be careful of that and understand how strap and forklifts can damage the edge of the panels. Methods of prevention include using a good operator, the right piece of equipment, and if you need protection, make sure you put dunnage or blocking in the corner of the panels so that we don't have that kind of damage that's gonna give us a problem. It's the other reason I've always carried a digital camera with me because I wanna document that kind of damage, especially when it's not, um, it's not my responsibility for having to fix it. Once we have these panels unloaded, we have to have them stored because they may be sitting on the site for several days or perhaps weeks. And when we store panels on site, there's a couple of key elements that we want to look at. One, keep them covered and keep them dry. And two, keep them from bowing or warping. And I say bowing and warping because the worst thing you can do is take panels, set them on uneven ground, or set them on stickers or dunnage, which is spread too far apart. If you have a panel that's anything longer than about 12 feet long, and you put stickers at the far ends of these panels, over time that panel will start to take a bow or it'll start to smile at you as we like to say. And when that happens it's going to make installing those panels much more difficult. So good rule of thumb, if we have panels that are longer than 12 feet, make sure that you use at least three stickers under those stacks and make sure you take the time so that they're all lined up in a nice level plane and when the panels come down on it they've got good firm contact on all of the stickers and the panels are not going to move. If you've got a rocking stack of panels after you set it down restack it. It's going to come back and bite you. Make sure that your stickers are wide enough so that you don't get deformation in the bottom of the panel where the sticker is. If you put too many panels, too much weight on too small of a sticker, you can literally crush the panel because there's too much point load on that small narrow sticker. Don't let that happen to you. And of course once we stack all the panels on the ground, let's get them covered up. And if we're going to cover them up, we have to do that with either tarps or plastic to keep bulk water off of them. We don't want that water uh, getting to the skins because again when it gets wet we have to let it dry out. The other thing is when you look at foams it's affected by UV so that means sunlight on the foam eventually is going to cause that foam to start to discolor or yellow. It's not necessarily a bad thing it's more aesthetics than anything else but when the customer or the homeowner sees the foam starting to turn yellow or get dingy they get concerned so keeping these things covered so that the UV light stays off of the panel means that they will stay nice and clean. Clean, dry, flat, and straight is what you're looking for when you stack up panels. So now that you've gone through your site, you've made all the necessary preparations, and you've got panels stacked up and dry, you've got a foundation that's in place, 
good to go, you're ready to have all of your trades come forward and, and get this thing done in, in a timely fashion, you're ready to start standing panels up. We're going to start talking about that in the next hour.